Good morning, everybody. It's great to see you. It's great to be here with you as we celebrate your accomplishments. Uh, I've put my watch here because I've been given a defined time frame. Um, 28 minutes. 28 minutes. <laughs> so I'll do my best to adhere to that time frame for you. So although my talk on the agenda says that I'm talking about something to do with global trends in implementation, I, I'm sort of, but not really. So I'm going to talk about two things that interest me in regards to uh, the way implementation is conducted and enacted out on the international setting. And one of those is the work you've done. It's implementation using an audit and feedback mechanistic approach to create change. And the other is much more theoretically orientated. It's about using theory-informed approaches to change, which ties in with uh, notions of um, of economic theory, as I'll explain in my talk, which hopefully is not as boring as that intro makes it actually sound. So I'll push on um, and we'll see how we go. But first I'd like to introduce um, someone you may or may not be familiar with, Professor Richard Thaler. He's from the University of Chicago. Uh, and he won uh, the Nobel Prize in 2017 for his study of behavioural economics and understanding how economics can use behavioural theories to influence subtly the way people choose to make decisions and therefore what they do on the basis of those uh, decisions. Thaler suggests that when we make changes to an individual's choice environment, which is an interesting phrase, uh, we can influence their behaviour. And his Nobel Prize was for uh, demonstrating a model that debunked the notion that human decision making is actually an entirely rational process. Uh, instead, he's highlighted in his work that all people, even those that claim to be very rational, rational are entirely susceptible to having rationality modified by the context they're in, the culture they're in, the peer group they're with, and environmental factors, so even workplace environmental factors. Or if you think about the last time you were in a shopping mall and whether or not anything within that environment influenced your behaviour. He unpacked all of this um, and we see evidence of the, the use of these kinds of theories all around us, even if we're not fully aware of them. So plain wrapping on cigarette packets to remove the level of sophistication in advertising. Um, opting out instead of opting in for organ donation. And I don't know what it's like for you, but in Australia, a lot of people have stopped smoking and they've started something called vaping. It's based on the notion that if you want to remove a harmful intervention, you should replace it with something. If you don't replace it, people go back to the harmful intervention. So vaping, as annoying as it might be, is less harmful than smoking and it's a replacement therapy. It's a behavioural intervention to try and reduce rates of smoking and it's been remarkably effective. Uh, so supermarkets, taxation and health related outcomes have all been um, introduced on the basis of Professor Thaler's early thinking and I want to introduce you to a couple of examples of it. Gosh, I'm already 10 minutes. Okay. Um, so have you been nudged? Nudge theory first made headlines in Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam back in 1999. And the concept was fairly simple, very simple, as a modification of a choice environment. What they did was they used a laser image to etch the picture of an insect, a fly, in the bottom of the urinals in the airport. So it's not a very glamorous example, but stay with me, okay? <laughs> What they found was that by etching an image in the bottom of the urinal, men's aim improved by 80%. <laughs> so it's not a, like I said, it's not a glamorous example, but it's a, and I'm sure no one in this room has ever experienced that particular challenge, but it just goes to show making a minor change led to a change in behaviour, even though people weren't actually aware they were really changing their behaviour. 
So it's kind of an interesting phenomenon, this notion of nudge theory. So Prof Thaler's early example showed that if you do tweak the environment, we don't know it, but we're likely to change what we do, a decision that we might make or might not have otherwise made. Uh, and, it, and it affects all the domains of our lives. So if you have young children, and I see someone's brought their beautiful daughter to join us today, and you go to a supermarket with young children, it's not the fruit and veg section that they're rushing to, is it? To try and... But what do you get as you leave a supermarket? The front rows near the exit are full of lollies, sugary drinks, and they're all at this eye level down here, right? They're all there designed to attract children's attention because they know parents by that stage want to get out. We've done our job, we want to leave. To get out quicker, we will purchase for our children to help them be more compliant in getting out. So it's not accidental. Uh, none of this is accidental things. Uh, and it's no wonder that he won the Nobel Prize uh, for his work. The second brief example um, is from Facebook, actually. So I just wonder who here is on Facebook? I don't believe it. I bet more of you are. OK, so before you go home this weekend, you have to friend me on Facebook. Um, but there is a very simple yet purposeful question on your homepage every time you log in. What's on your mind? It's a simple question, but it invites you to share something that you might not otherwise have posted or shared. What is on my mind? Oh, I've been thinking about X. It's also the question that unlocks the details of your life and helps for Facebook to turn your thoughts, your links and your contacts into a multi-billion dollar profit generating industry. In fact, it's also persuasive. Facebook is a persuasive medium. And in um, 2014, the Facebook team ran an experiment. They took a rather large sample. They took 700,000 Facebook users, divided them into two groups, and they used algorithms to send negative news feeds to half the group and positive news feeds to the other half of the group. And they watched and measured what happened. So people log into Facebook, they see negative news, negative stories. The question, what's on your mind, led to a measurable increase in depression and negative posts by people that got the negative news. They didn't really know that that's what was driving their thinking. And they could test this because they had a, uh, a, an, another group who got very positive news. And those people posted more words and used more positive messaging compared to the other group. So they knew that what was going into Facebook was having an effect on people's mood and sense of well-being. And this, again, is an illustration of uh, behavioural theory. Facebook has the capacity to make you feel good or bad just by tweaking what goes into your news feeds and can therefore impact our purchasing behaviours. Because what does shopping make you feel? Good, yeah. Even me, I, I hate shopping, but when I get something, I like, you know, I'm happy with myself. Um, so, the question for us, have you been nudged? Here's sort of a, another example of how it's worked. This is about people not turning up for a job interview, which actually sounds entirely irrational, but people have reasons for why they don't do that. And a behavioural science team was asked, can you help us improve the rate at which people turn up? So they started with a text. And this is verbatim, the text. 11% of people turned up. Then they added a salutation and a name. Hi, Sam. Made it more particular to an individual. And the rate rose to 15%. 15% of people now turned up. They thought they could probably do better. So they added a closing statement as well. And they evaluated each of these changes. So, mm -hmm. hi Sam, I've booked a place for you. Good luck, Michael. And the rate rose to 27%. So when the baseline's 11%, an increase to 27 is probably pretty fair. Uh, and this approach then was rolled out nationally across Britain, across England. Uh, so they, they were obviously very happy with that as, as an approach. 
it spills over into healthcare a lot as well, uh, and, and often in very helpful ways. So if you think about transitions from old soap and water, you know those little soaps that used to go soggy and if you tried to pick it up your fingers would go through it. Now there is alcohol hand gel virtually everywhere in hospitals. Every bed, uh, every bay you walk into there's one. Uh, and so it's a, a common phenomenon now to see. Where has it come from in health and how does it work? Oh, well, I'm so glad you asked and I'm going to take a minute or two to tell you just a little bit about it. Not very long though because uh, I want to move on to, to talk about some other things. One of the most common um, trends in implementation science today in health is to look at behavioural theories and how they can be better utilised to help improve outcomes. We're not looking at it from a philosophic perspective there are ethical issues with this though. If you think about choice and freedom of choice and what that should mean, it should also probably mean the right to make harmful choices. And in fact, this attempts to take that out of the equation. So it's interesting philosophically, but we'll focus on the pragmatics uh, as much as we can today. And the claims in terms of health are, we want to change behavior in a way that makes it easier to make the right choices or easier to use the right kinds of services. Uh, you know, and we've seen that, um, for example, in the uptake of organ donation that requires you to opt out of a system. In the, even financially, in the introduction of superannuation in Australia, uh, in England, it's a requirement. You don't get to opt into superannuation it's there, it's a done deal, and it's designed, why? Because they know it with an ageing population, it's difficult to sustain without some pre-planned funding process. So all of these things are, are really interesting. I want to briefly show you some of the basis. It's very exciting, isn't it? So here we have uh, where the TDF is the theoretical domains framework, and it's based on some very extensive study which looked at what kinds of behavioural attributes or elements do we see in published implementation studies. And they used an expert panel, a Delphi process, and through a constant comparative reductive approach, they came out with, if we want to really nail down and define implementation attributes that are theory informed in healthcare, there are 14. And you can see them in that left column on, on your screen. It's based on the notion that if we want to get successful implementation, we should add theory-informed behavioural interventions. And I think your own reflections today will probably back some of this up. Getting change is not simply about introducing a policy, isn't it? It's about persuasion. It's about uh, getting people to understand the motive and why you want to achieve something as well as how you would like to achieve it. And you've all had that experience over the last six months. So uh, it's a good theory and it makes logical, rational sense. But I'm going to, in the next set of slides, challenge that just a little bit because I think there are questions about this approach. It is a, a big driving approach internationally now. Um, but I think there are some important questions. And some of them relate to the feasibility, appropriateness and effectiveness of it uh, as an approach. But I know you're just dying to know, how does it actually work, Craig? How do we do this? Well, I'm very glad you asked. And it looks a little bit like this. Now, keeping in mind, there are 14 individual domains. Each of these steps and the questions that go with it could, in theory, be applied to all 14 domains. <clears throat> which I think makes our program look rather uncomplicated and uncomplex. This is highly complex kind of work to do in implementation planning and it needs a whole group to establish which domains do we select on what basis and then knowing what domains we have, who needs to do what differently? So who's the target of a change process and work that through with each of the domains and then what do we anticipate the barriers and facilitators will be? So that's step two, to try and predetermine and predefine these before commencing the actual implementation phase. And then 
then knowingly selecting behavioral interventions to apply in that context. I mean, I'm already finding this a little bit challenging. Uh, so there are things there, and it, in detail, there are then sub-questions that help you unpack it, but I think it's quite complex. What I've done uh, with some colleagues in JBI is looked at implementation reports. Uh, obviously, you'll be writing and publishing one yourself, and I've looked at uh, a sample of them to see, given behavioral science is such a trend right now, is there evidence of behavioral theory in the implementation work that JBI clinical fellows do? Uh, I want to show you the answer. But first, a brief recap. This is, of course, the evidence implementation component of the JBI model. And I think you're familiar with that. And what you've experienced in your fellowship is a model-informed approach to thinking about implementation. So it's helped guide and define uh, the short course residencies you've done, but also the methods you've applied. And it actually gives you the framework for the mechanism of action of implementation. It helps explain and facilitate your implementation activities. So what did we do? Well, again, I'm glad you asked. We wanted to establish whether or not the domains or the constructs of the TD, that should be F for framework, are implicitly embedded in JBI reports, and, and then to really understand that in a little bit more detail. So uh, doing anything novel, of course, you start with a pilot. So we did a small pilot on three reports, found that it informed our development of a data extraction instrument. And then we used purposive sampling, which means we took whatever was easiest and quickest to get access to. And we estimated two years worth of published reports would be enough. And we had no limitations on the inclusion of those reports, which led to us looking at 21 published reports. Here's part of our results. This is just introductory stuff. Of the 21 reports, the majority were conducted by uh, nursing professions uh, of various specialties. That included midwives, it included rural, uh, and there were some multidisciplinary as well. They were from, we did no filtering, we just took the first two years. So some were from China, Australia, the USA, and Singapore. And by special, you can see the specialties there. So we had quite a diverse group, and we knew we had covered diverse contexts as well. What we found here, this is just a simple report. So on the left column, we've got the domains of the TDF, and on the right, we've got the frequency with which they were represented in JBI Clinical Fellows reports. And if you'd asked me before we started this, what will it look like, I would not have said there'd be much, if any. But in fact, maybe thinking about behavioral approaches is just more human than it is theoretical, because it was all there. So what we found, the most frequently covered ones were related to goals and goal setting, to knowledge, to social and professional roles and identity and the environmental context. The second most frequent kinds of domains were self-belief around individual capacity and group capacity, skills, behavior regulation, and social influences. And then there were some that were barely mentioned at all. And these were things like emotion, optimism, belief, memory attention and reinforcement, and intention or intentionality. There's, what I found interesting in this process was uh, there were the high frequency characteristics were all fairly pragmatic operational things that would readily be applicable in any health setting and are kind of generic skills, intrinsic almost, uh, in a health context. The low frequency ones though, you know, like emotion, etc., those were very much more subjective and intrinsic. They were less operational and more about belief and understanding. So they're less tangible. And I think to me it, it does make some sense as to why these are sort of less, um, less frequently utilised and less frequently uh, evident in these reports. So from there, um, what we ended up doing was looking at uh, what does this mean in terms of thinking about, uh, okay, here's this global trend, which is to understand the role of behaviour theory in helping modify and improve the healthcare environment. So this is a, an altruistic aim. It's a very positive, beneficial aim for society as a whole. 
And that then, how does that compare with audit and feedback, which has been around since uh, Don Obedian was a small boy? You know, it's like 1960s and earlier, and it fits that model of thinking about health, the way healthcare is organised. Healthcare is based around structure followed by processes. And from those structures and processes, we normally identify and measure outcomes. So that's the SPO model, of the Donabedian Quality Improvement Model. And they didn't, I was worried that they wouldn't be compatible. They didn't seem compatible when I first started looking into it. And given that the behavioural approaches are really emergent on the world, seen as an implementation innovation, I wanted to, to have some kind of knowledge about how is this working? So it was a very small study, 21 papers. But what it seems to suggest is that behavioural theory domains are intrinsic in audit and feedback-based models of implementation, even if pre-planning to use theory is not. Which I think tells us something about the origins of behavioural approaches to change. I don't think they're intrinsically embedded in a theory. I think they're intrinsically embedded in people. And whether it's our training that does it, or whether it's simply our humanity that does it, we think in complex ways. Uh, and I, I find that absolutely interesting as a conclusion from this uh, study. Of course, it's a little piece of research. I have to have a caveat which says further research is needed before we conclude anything about conceptual framing. Uh, and that's just my caveat. But I, I, I think there's some interesting observations here. The other thing about the behavioural approaches to theory is I showed you one paper which was uh, a validation study. So do we have the domains right and do they probably work? And the answer from that study was yes we have the domains right and yes they probably work. But does it really really work when you apply it in a healthcare context? And here I think it's it's going to be a fascinating field of study probably for at least the next 10 years because the jury is out. It is not in and there's not a full consensus about the effectiveness of this as an intervention. Now, that then is interesting because audit and feedback, we unequivocally know it works. There is brilliant data, better analyses on the effectiveness of audit and feedback for implementation. This is a little bit more novel. The theory is sound, but does it always, does it consistently work? Well, here's an example. There's a whole number of areas where, if people were rational, we could save hundreds of billions of dollars per year on the health budget. But we can't and we don't because people are not always rational. I've got to tell a story about my mum. Uh, two weeks ago, we were out at a social function and she collapsed. And we had to call an ambulance to take her to hospital. Turned out she was okay, but I had a, a discussion with her afterwards about what had been happening in her life. She's on four different heart medications and she had decided to change when she was taking them, which order she would take them in, or indeed whether she would take them that day or not. She didn't make that decision in discussion with her GP or her cardiologist. She just thought, I don't need blood pressure tablets at night because I'm going to bed. So that to her sounded rational. Is that really a rational decision though? No, it's not. It's completely irrational. But only an outsider would say that's not rational. And we all have this mechanism actually where we think our own decision making is rational. But to an outside observer it might not be. So, mum is okay. She got a stern telling off from me, I can tell you that. Uh, and she now knows not to change things. But if we could get things like medication adherence to work effectively in the healthcare context, we would say billions. HIV, tuberculosis, malaria, high blood pressure, mental health, uh, child and adolescent health related issues. So lots of questions, not a lot of evidence. But there has been one uh, that I'm aware of, randomized controlled trial, looking at the effectiveness of theory informed behavioral interventions to improve adherence for healthcare. And it was quite a good, big, well-funded trial. It was called the HeartStrong trial. What the, well, you can see what they wanted to look at. Wireless technology plus uh, behavioral economic approaches to look at survivorship uh, post-MI, so myocardial infarction or heart attack. And they looked at 1,500 adults, which is a pretty good 
sample, isn't it, really? You know, this is going to find some interesting data. Here's the interventions they applied. Firstly, Group A, who was obviously the uh, intervention of interest group, they got electronic pill bottles that monitor medication taking. This is a sophisticated, expensive intervention. There was a reward system. So if you take your medication, if the pill bottle sends the Wi-Fi signal that yes, they've had their medication, you automatically go in a lottery with a 20% chance of winning $5 every day for a year and a 1% chance of winning $50 every day for a year. And now, who would find that motivating? Who would go, okay, I'm taking my tablets? Again, I think some of you are not quite telling the truth because there are a few <laughs> hands down. I would be, you would, Zach, wouldn't you? Yeah. So not only this, if somebody didn't comply and didn't take their medication, the pill bottle would send a wireless signal to a family member to go, your mum did not take her pill this morning. So there was no, <laughs> <laughs> there's no hiding in this intervention, right? They also had access to additional social support and social services. There were people employed specifically for the full duration of the trial uh, and a full-time engagement officer was also appointed. I think this would only ever happen in the UK, by the way. But anyway, so this was a expensive, sophisticated, intensive intervention arm. Group B were told, here's your tablets, you should take them as directed. What was the conclusions? Here they are on screen. No difference in time to hospitalisation. No difference in total number of hospitalisations. No difference in mortality, medical costs, and no difference in medication adherence. Aren't we interesting things, us humans? <laughs> So I want to, uh, in my last 20 minutes, sorry, in my last 10 minutes, 8 minutes, <laughs> in my last 4 minutes, here's a quick example of what I see when I hear you guys talk about implementation reports. This is the topic, pre and post data. What did I learn when I read this implementation report? This is from somebody who had no expertise in implementation prior to their clinical fellowship. I learned that people think about capacity and resources by treating implementation as a pilot-based process to facilitate the engagement and learning. I learned that clinical fellows develop skills in how to increase the accessibility and access to the resources that they're bringing into their workplace. I learned that by undertaking education sessions and providing that across shifts and across units, clinical fellows are skilled in establishing the clinical relevance of the work that they're doing while they're in their implementation program. I learned that clinical fellows have the skills or develop the skills to routinize workflow processes to enhance the sustainability of what they do and how they do it that they network and bring colleagues and partners and friends into the process, sometimes by nominating them as change champions or super users, before it's got a good catchphrase. And by doing so, they are, you, they are actively building opinion, leadership and persuasiveness. And that they have a high level of skill and ability in terms of obtaining consensus and generating positive interactions to facilitate change. So I thought audit and feedback is, a, is not to be taken for granted. It's an interesting, complex intervention, and you are, when you do it and use it, you are using a high-level skill set uh, uh, in your approach. And I mapped it out in terms of what is the organisational elements. So what have you done as clinical fellows? You may be asking yourself that too sometimes. You've created leadership and buy-in from your organisation. From there, you've moved through some identification engagement processes with stakeholders. You've understood the local context and you've developed planning approaches, then you've done some piloting. All of this has facilitated uh, the development of comprehensive educational processes, engagement strategies, and demonstrated your responsiveness to the workplace environment as it changes over time. That has helped uh, align your work with organizational priorities, systems, policies and procedures. So you've shown clinical leadership and you've undertaken a complicated uh, intervention. 
So should we be nudging each other more? Well, I think the evidence says maybe not. We don't need to. In short and in closing, much to Zach's relief, don't nudge me. I think you can relax and celebrate. Your clinical fellowship project was awesome, effective, and it's had an impact. Thank you.